So welcome uh, to this uh, NUPI seminar. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all to this seminar that is uh, about what's in the new EU-UK relationship agreement. Uh, this seminar is part of uh, our Europe series. This is sponsored by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and is edited by Monika uh, Riker. Now, as you know, 23rd of June 2016, the UK and the Brits had the referendum on uh, their future association to the EU. A small majority voted uh, to leave the European Union. More than four and a half years later, uh, the UK, this, uh, the end of uh, December this year, the UK left the EU and the transition period came to an end. This was an extremely burdensome and cumbersome uh, process for the UK. Three prime ministers uh, were involved. Uh, all political parties in the UK uh, had uh, real difficulties and uh, uh, a hard time in finding a compromise. And this was also a process that burdened the courts and the institutions in the UK seriously. Uh, they ended up with an agreement that is rather limited, closer to what was initially called a hard Brexit. Now, much has been said about the UK's position and handling of Brexit. But what about the EU? What about the EU's handling and negotiations of, regarding to Brexit? Uh, I remember in 2016, right after the referendum, we had Thomas Bagger, a German expert and advisor to the German foreign minister at the time, uh, reflecting upon the consequences for the EU of Brexit. And he said three principles were supposed to guide uh, uh, EU's position. The first was that for Germany and for the other EU countries, EU was much more important than the UK. UK is important, but the EU is more important. The second point he said is that we should not punish the Brits, but we should keep the, uh, treat them fairly, but not punish them. And thirdly, he said, Brexit will involve a lot of uncertainty and huge transaction costs. And those costs of uncertainty should be carried by the Brits, not by the EU. So that was his initial position prior to the negotiations. Now, uh, we have today uh, with us Georg Rikles to reflect on uh, EU's position and EU's negotiations on Brexit. And it's... Uh, uh, Georg Rikles has a first-hand knowledge of Brexit. He's been a part of the task force uh, and he's been, I don't know if you, it's fair to say, the right hand of M Michel Bonnier throughout the whole negotiations. And it's uh, just amazing, I think, uh, to have him here with us today at NUPI. He's probably not, uh, certainly not had any holidays uh, during this period. Uh, probably also had quite uh, a few hours sleeping, I think, during this very hard negotiation period. So it's a great honor to have Georg with us today. And by the way, it's also another amazing thing. Georg is, as some of you might know, is Norwegian. So that's a strange thing in itself. How come that the Norwegian came to be the right hand of Michel uh, Barnier when, the nego when negotiating uh, Brexit? Now, uh, I will soon give the floor to, to Georg and he will make a presentation of 35 up to 40 minutes uh, sharing his views. Uh, I'd just like to say one thing uh, that, as you know, Brexit is now in a state of what we could call a blame game. Who, who is to blame for the costs of the implementation of the various agreements? for the cost and difficulties for the EU and for the cost and difficulties for the UK. So this is a blame game going on. And uh, as I, I understood it, officials in the EU are not supposed to engage in that blame game. Uh, and so Georg has asked us uh, kindly to say that uh, he, he, will, he will offer some personal reflections, but please don't take that into the general blame game discussion. So we would like not to treat these his PowerPoints as remarks and not to quote them too extensively. 
So on that note, I give the floor to Georg and he will give his presentation and then we open for a Q&A. So Georg, the floor is yours. Great to have you with us here at NUPI today. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ulf, uh, Ulf and uh, good morning to each and every one of you. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to participate in, in this seminar uh, today. It's something I've been looking forward to, so it's for me to, to thank you most definitely. Uh, I can only echo maybe the comments you made that uh, uh, the presentation and, and what I say today is, is, is more of a, a nature of personal reflection, so please uh, respect that and don't take that into the, into the, the public uh, domain. So with that, I, I propose just to jump straight into my presentation. So um, to uh, kick off, uh, I wanted to start with this uh, slide, uh, illustrating in a way the, the long and tortuous process uh, these Brexit negotiations uh, have been since the UK's referendum till the agreement of uh, a new UK uh, partnership. It's now actually more than five years ago since uh, Boris Johnson, uh, not Prime Minister then obviously, speaking outside his, outside his house, stated his uh, ag uh, agonizingly difficult decision, uh, but conclusion to vote for real change. And it's almost five years uh, now since the UK referendum, uh, where a majority of, of British people voted uh, to leave the EU. After more than, as you are all well aware, for more than four decades of, of deep economic and, and political uh, integration. What I wanted to do today uh, was uh, essentially to touch upon three things. Um, first, I wanted to speak a little bit about the EU's fundamental objectives uh, in these negotiations. Second, I wanted to uh, uh, come with a brief explainer, if I can call it that, on what is in the agreements and in particular in the, the future relationship agreement, the main future relationship agreement, the trade uh, and cooperation agreement, the TCA, and, and finally share some thoughts on, uh, on the way forward and the wider uh, context, so basically what the deal holds uh, for, for, the, for the future and, and, uh, and, 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 and some lessons or some points we should be uh, attentive to. So, uh, coming then to, to start with uh, the EU's fundamental objectives. Of course, a lot was said in uh, the UK referendum ca campaign about Brexit being easy, about the deal being over and ready, uh, and that ultimately also that what mattered for the EU in, in these negotiations was the, the trading relationship and in particular German car exports to the UK. And, and I think here, just um, the look at the, the trade figures show that uh, uh, there is a certain degree of, of relativity, relativity or uh, uh, asymmetrical importance in this uh, trading relationship. What you see very clearly is, of course, that the single market and also other third uh, country exports uh, matter so much more for, for, uh, for the EU uh, than uh, the trading relationship with uh, the UK uh, in itself. But uh, more uh, specifically, if we are to pin down what uh, I consider were the EU's fundamental objectives uh, in uh, the negotiations, uh, I would move beyond actually uh, the trade la trading relationship altogether. And I would say that there were uh, three fundamental interests on the EU side and, and illustrate them as, them as follows. Uh, the first being peace and stability on the island of Ireland, uh, the second being upholding the single market, and the third uh, being to reach a good, deep and comprehensive future relationship with the, uh, with the UK. So let me say just a few more words on each of these, because in re I think each of these three uh, elements are uh, shorthand for something broader. So to start with the peace and stability on the island of Ireland. Uh, obviously, this was a uh, fundamental uh, uh, negotiation of objective in its own right. Uh, the end of violence and community segregation uh, in this part of Western Europe is only two decades back. Uh, the troubles cost more than uh, 3,500 uh, uh, lost lives and, and many more victims, of course. And, and so disruption and return to conflict would obviously be a momentous failure for, for all parties. 
But I think it's important to note that the EU's position here, its strong focus on the issue, the solidarity with Ireland by all, all the other 26 member states, also stands for something broader. And I think uh, the, the real and, and, and significance of, of this priority or objective in the negotiations is to make the proof that when a member state's uh, fundamental interests are at stake, existential interests even, then all stand together shoulder to shoulder. Otherwise, the union uh, has no meaning. So that is the first point I would highlight as a fundamental negotiation objective. The Second uh, fundamental objective uh, uh, I would uh, uh, mention is uh, upholding the integrity of the single market. Uh, in a way, uh, the single market is the union's greatest asset, at least in uh, economic uh, terms. And from day one, actually in the first, very first reaction uh, of uh, the, the heads of state of government uh, of June 2016, uh, so just a uh, uh, few hours after the referendum, uh, they made clear that the four freedoms hang together, that there could be no uh, cherry picking on uh, the single uh, market. And uh, to say a few more, more uh, words about that, what that meant in reality is that the UK, uh, as a departing member state, could not be allowed to have one foot inside and one foot outside. And again, this stands for something broader. Uh, you mentioned it in your introduction, Ulf. This was not about punishing uh, the UK, far from it, but it's simple recognition of the fact that every society, every uh, body politic, every organization, even the sports club, is founded on the balance of rights and obligations. And if you can keep the rights, if you allow somebody to keep those rights, but forego the obligation, then there is no union. Uh, and so that was uh, very clearly uh, an important uh, uh, objective uh, that can be summed up as, as uh, defending the, the integrity of the single market. And then uh, finally, the third uh, fundamental objective, in my view, uh, creating the conditions of a good, strong, comprehensive future relationship with the, with the UK. And, 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 and obviously we live in a in a difficult, challenging world, we are in the midst of profound transformations on all fronts. Uh, you are permanent observers of, of that uh, here at NUPI. Uh, so it was very clear also for, to, to, to everyone involved, uh, to the leaders not least, that uh, the UK uh, was leaving the EU, but not Europe. So not the fundamental values, the shared interests, uh, the shared history and outlook that uh, should bind us to, together. So, so that I would really highlight as the third fundamental objective, the, the capacity uh, to continue to walk hand, uh, hand in hand uh, in uh, today's uh, world. So, so all these fundamental concerns, uh, the three I mentioned, translated in uh, from the EU side, uh, a very clear stance and a great effort to secure an orderly withdrawal. Uh, first and foremost, and then to secure an orderly future uh, relationship uh, in these two negotiations that succeeded each other. And, 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 and to put it uh, in, in a sentence, a statement that Michel Barnier employed on many times, um, he always said that no deal would never be the EU's choice uh, or doing. Uh, throughout this negotiation, it was a fundamental concern of the EU to reach agreement, both on withdrawal and the future partnership. Uh, so I would say in this, uh, fundamentally, the EU's attitude has been of one of, of regret, obviously, but respect. Uh, regret because Brexit uh, was ever only going to be loose-loose, uh, at least in the EU's view. But still, there was a duty to negotiate in good faith, uh, respecting the choice of the majority of the British people and the choices of the British government. And, and this um, uh, result uh, resulted in the withdrawal agreement from uh, the 17th of October 2000. Uh, and, and 19, and the trade and cooperation agreement finalized on Christmas Eve uh, last year. These agreements obviously do not exclude significant uh, losses and disruptions across vast fields of society and on both sides. And you made uh, um, allusion to that, uh, Ulf, in your in introductions. Uh, but uh, I think even though we have to admit that the situations created therefore not are, are perfect, still I think we should 
very much speak about these agreements reached in positive terms because in fact what they do is to avoid even uh, greater uh, disruptions. Let me now turn to uh, my uh, to the withdrawal agreement itself. Uh, I will not say too uh, many things about this. You got the withdrawal agreement slide up now, just to be clear. Yeah. Just yeah. To check. Yeah, that's super. Uh, much about much has been discussed already about the withdrawal agreement. Um, it's in force since the first of February 2020. And it sought, uh, as I'm sure you're aware, to bring legal certainty where the UK's withdrawal from the EU created uncertainty. And this uh, concerned in uh, particular citizens' rights, uh, but also financial settlement, uh, a number of other separation issues from how to deal with uh, existing stocks of data or public procurement procedures or running uh, goods already placed on the market, on the market for instance. Uh, it also contains an important governance chapter, uh, a transition period that lasted till the end of, of last year, uh, under which uh, the UK, even though having left the EU, being not an EU member state, having left the institutions, e UK citizens no longer being EU citizens, that ensured the continued application of the single market and the customs union. And it also has, in this withdrawal agreement, importantly, um, three protocols, one on Ireland, Northern Ireland, one on Gibraltar, and one on the sovereign base areas uh, in uh, Cyprus. I now come uh, very quickly to uh, the protocol, uh, because that is uh, something that uh, uh, focuses a lot of the debate these days and also throughout the negotiations. I think if uh, I try to choose my words with care, but um, uh, in essence, uh, what this complex protocol does, what it tries to do is to provide a legally operational solution in order to protect the Good Friday or the Belfast Agreement, as the Brits call it, in all its dimensions, and hence uh, to continue to underpin uh, peace and stability on the island uh, of uh, Ireland. I think the key point here to note is that um, there is a sort of a semi-constitutional settlement in the Good Friday or Belfast Agreement, which relies on the idea that Northern Ireland citizens should be able to be both British and Irish uh, in every practical thing on where uh, they sense uh, belonging. So just as the Northern, uh, as Northern Ireland left the EU with the rest of the UK, and its citizens remain part of its economy and society, uh, it seemed imperative in the context of uh, the withdrawal of the UK, including Northern Ireland, to avoid a hard border on the island of Ireland so that Northern Ireland citizens, in addition to being uh, UK citizens in every practical sense, could also re remain part of the whole island economy and society. And, and uh, of course, the conundrum here was to be able to do this while safeguarding the integrity of the UK, of the EU single market, uh, which means uh, having the necessary customs and regular controls on the movement of goods, uh, in particular, um, uh, at the, at the outer, outer limits of the single market and customs union. And here, the very pragmatic consideration uh, that was taken, uh, that was found, was that uh, these controls, these checks, should not take place across the 500 kilometer land border with more than 300 crossing points, but at the points of entry to Ireland as a whole. And, and I think that is, in very simplified terms, uh, the, uh, the, the settlement. Now to the uh, trade and cooperation uh, agreement reached between the EU and the UK uh, last uh, the December. Up. There's a new slide coming up. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, this agreement uh, has entered into application now provisionally as of 1st of January 2020, uh, while we await the, the, the final conclusion procedures uh, on both sides, and notably also a vote on the European uh, Parliament's uh, side. I think to describe it very briefly, uh, the agreement we have reached is a very comprehensive uh, agreement. It covers nearly all aspects of the future 
EU-UK uh, relationship, the future cooperation in a single uh, treaty, um, with the exception of, of two side agreements, one on civil nuclear cooperation and the other on exchange of classified information, uh, uh, which form separate agreements in, in line with what we have with other third countries. Um, the TCA, uh, so the TCA is, is rather comprehensive, it's complex, uh, around 1500 pages or so. Uh, and I think to try to understand it uh, a bit better and to simplify, a usual way to think about it is uh, that it is built around four uh, pillars. First, uh, it is composed of a free trade agreement that uh, aims to be both ambitious and fair. Uh, what this free trade, trade agreement secures is tariffs and zero quotas for all goods exchange, which is something that is, uh, from the EU side, unprecedented uh, in our trade agreements with advanced economies. And of course, this is in particularly important for uh, agriculture and fisheries products, but also for industrial goods. Uh, I mentioned cars earlier. Without the deal, car uh, exports would have faced 10% uh, tariffs, which would have obviously been a heavy blow, uh, not only for consumers, but also for the automotive industry uh, uh, on both sides. Of course, to benefit from these exceptional preferential tariffs, um, all products imported to the Union must uh, comply with what one calls uh, rules of origin, which uh, in essence require that the goods are substantially produced in the EU or in the United Kingdom uh, to be benefit from this zero tariff uh, access and the goods but also strictly respect all the EU's regulatory standards to enter the single uh, market. Uh, and, and, and this of course, uh, this uh, rules of origin uh, regime and regulatory regime of course is an essential condition for the EU to protect our consumers and the integrity of our internal market and to serve our also our long-term economic interests. I don't think one should be shy of saying so. Uh, it implies adaptation costs for businesses whose supply and distribution chains rely on the UK, uh, but uh, there, it was not a possibility from the EU side to uh, accept that the, the uh, UK as a third country continued to act as, as a production or distribution hub for uh, the uh, single uh, market. Naturally, this uh, free trade agreement uh, does not only cover goods, but also services and uh, investment. Have a quick look at that. Uh, services and investment, digital trade, maritime services, intellectual properties, SMEs, all these are aspects that are, of course, the very essential in the functioning of uh, uh, modern economies um, and hence in the trade between UK and, and, and the EU. And thanks to the, the, the TCA, uh, what is being delivered is the possibility to uh, businesses on both sides to continue to supply uh, services on even footing uh, uh, with uh, domestic service suppliers as long as they respect the applicable rules of the uh, host country. Within uh, this chapter also we have agreed ambitious uh, public procurement rules, uh, notably ensuring equal access to procurement, opportunities uh, and uh, there is a small chapter also on financial services. I mention it because it's obviously an area of uh, significant offensive uh, interest from the UK. Here the agreement is rather very limited uh, and market access uh, is rather uh, re regulated by uh, unilateral equivalence decisions uh, when that is in each side's uh, interest. Uh, in addition to what this FTA delivers on, um, on um, goods and services, um, I think what is very important to note in this uh, TCA is that the free trade agreement is premised on what I would call, on what we call unprecedented aspiration, uh, a more modern, fairer and more sustainable uh, trade policy. 
So uh, clearly a trade policy, uh, it was the EU's goal that does not only aim to offer more choice at lower prices, but that also seeks uh, a fair treatment of workers and decent working conditions that respects the safe, uh, safety and health of consumers and crucially also that protects uh, environment and uh, climate uh, objectives. And, and it's very much in this area that the, the TCA, the FTA uh, agreement within the, the new cooperation partnership breaks new ground uh, in, in the sense that it commits us in a very ambitious manner to continue respecting high levels of protection that applied at the end of the transition period on environmental issues, climate, carbon pricing, social standards, protection of workers. This is what one calls uh, non-regression. Uh, and these uh, terms of the agreements are, of course, essential to guarantee fair competition between the UK and the EU, a level playing field for the long term. And, and uh, to precisely to make sure that this level playing field uh, subsides and, and, and continues in the long term, uh, the agreement foresees either party the possibility to take unilateral and proportionate so-called rebalancing measures in case of significant regulatory divergences which would impact trade in a material way. For instance, by then introducing tariffs on quotas. So that's for standards. And uh, a little bit similarly, there is quite a bit of ambition compared to uh, other FTAs uh, in the area of state, state aid control and transparencies, as uh, transparency with binding rules to make sure that either party does not unduly favor its businesses and distort competition. Um, so, so that is also an important uh, uh, chapter or part of the agreement that on which one spent quite a bit of time of negotiations in the context of uh, different starting positions on how should this should be uh, solved. And finally, of course, to ensure that these stand standards are respected in practice, we have also agreed on, on, on binding enforcement and dispute settlement mechanism, which uh, guarantee uh, enforcement on both sides, also in the UK, including by UK courts, and the possibility to react very swiftly with unilateral uh, measures in case of distortive uh, actions. So I think that is, is absolutely uh, something very important to highlight in uh, this uh, in the TCA. That takes me now to the second big chapter, the second pillar of uh, our uh, uh, of our TCA. Uh, which concerns uh, more uh, broadly the connectivity, uh, sustainability and uh, the opportunities that are offered to uh, different economic. Uh. So to, to, to summarize it a bit, in addition to a rather deep FTA, if you look at these level tier playing field provisions, we have uh, in essence uh, a very broad uh, agreement. Here again, of course, the aim from the EU side was never to recreate uh, the fluid, seamless situation of the single market, but to maximize mutual benefits between two sovereign partners. So uh, to take the example of transport, uh, I will not uh, read everything you see on the slide, uh, but we have uh, agreed to grant reciprocal traffic rights to our road uh, haulage uh, operators and air carriers, and, and of course, in this context, to ensure high standards of security, environmental protection, workers' rights, and passenger protection, uh, to make sure that uh, the flow of goods and passengers between our two markets uh, remains uh, organized. Uh, similarly, on, uh, on energy, uh, this is... Uh, uh, an area where we also agreed to a new cooperation uh, framework, uh, uh, rather ambitious for a third country, uh, to guarantee the security of energy supplies, to stimulate the development of renewable energy sources, in particular in the North Sea, and to optimize uh, electricity uh, trading, again, without reproducing the levels of efficiency guaranteed in uh, the single market. And, and again, uh, in this area, in line with the, the spirit of, of maintaining standards and, and, and raising standards, in this field also, the agreement contains ambitions, targets on uh, decarbonization, 
uh, and energy like transport includes specific commitments on uh, the environment and, and, and climate and also on the conditions for uh, granting subsidies and uh, competition uh, uh, to the other party. Uh, a, uh, another important part of the negotiations from, on which, uh, well, which basically took us all the way to the 24th of December last year was fisheries. Here, what was important for the EU was to secure European fishing vessels the right to continue to fish in British waters where they have fished for decades. Uh, this was needless to say a very difficult negotiations, where, negotiation which went to the core uh, of the UK sovereignty and, and the take back control narrative, if you like. Um, and, and we knew, of course, that maintaining status quo uh, was never an option in this area, given that the UK is now an independent coast. But I think the, the final agreement is a very good one for, for, for the EU. Uh, where we probably should say we were much less successful was in the area of mobility. Uh, we did not manage to uh, convince the United Kingdom to include uh, ambitious clauses on mobility in our draft agreement. Uh, although we did obtain a firm commitment on non-discrimination between EU citizens with regard to short-term visas specifically. Um, uh, regretful, uh, but it's the UK's choice. Uh, it's just another example of how Brexit will reduce opportunities uh, for students, researchers, uh, workers, pensioners in both directions. Nonetheless, we also agreed uh, to some guarantees on social security for, uh, for those citizens that will move between the such as uh, maintaining guarantees for pensions rights, medical coverage, uh, namely for pensioners, students, uh, short-term visitors, uh, so i.e. tourism or business, uh, paternity allowances, uh, compensation related to work-related accidents. Uh, so so a, a big bulk of what one can do in terms of social security co coordination, but again, not everything, to be clear. And the agreement does not cover, for instance, um, family allowances, and workers from the EU and the UK will remain subject to uh, a healthcare surcharge uh, during uh, five, uh, five years. A last element in this broader economic uh, partnership that I should uh, mention is uh, the uh, continued uh, uh, participation of the UK in uh, union uh, programs, albeit on a new uh, legal base. Uh, so that means that, for instance, our East should be able to continue to collaborate, collaborate in mutually beneficial programs such as Horizon Europe for research and innovation or cooperation programs on the civil use of uh, nuclear energy. But here again, there is also very clearly regrets on the EU side. Uh, we did not manage to negotiate or to be more specific, uh, the UK chose in the end not to participate uh, in the Erasmus student uh, exchange program, which is yet uh, an example of, of a very tangible restriction of opportunities uh, that uh, Brexit uh, brings about. So that uh, those elements conclude uh, the, uh, the the second chapter, the broader economic uh, partnership, and it brings me to the the third pillar of uh, the uh, TCA. Um, which is uh, which concerns uh, security, a security partnership, a citizen security. This is a more autonomous pillar in the TCA. Uh, as we always said, our citizen security cannot be traded uh, off. Georg, sorry, now now you show the governance slide. Just say uh, security. Sorry about that. Apology. That is one too early. That's good. Uh, so, so needless to say, the fight against crime and terrorism requires very close cooperation between the EU and, and UK. Uh, one needs to be able to count on each other. Uh, although, uh, with the UK as a third country, outside the Schengen area, uh, which stops free movement with the UK, uh, the exchange of data uh, will not uh, be as before, the cooperation will not be as uh, ambitious as before. Uh, the agreement does not replicate Schengen advantages, such as 
the automatic exchange of information or direct access to the Schengen information system, for instance. Still, the cooperation framework we have put in place will uh, enable strong elements of, of cooperation uh, between police and judicial uh, authorities within the frameworks of Europol, Eurojust, uh, in, the, in the area of surrender, uh, even though it doesn't happen in the context of European arrest warrant. warrant um, the, the agreement will also enable swift, swift exchange of, of PNR, passenger, passenger name record, uh, but also data on DNA, fingerprints, vehicle registration. It's a, it's a, it's a database called PRUM and, and criminal record uh, information. Uh, so, so, uh, so this is obviously something that was very important to get in place, but it also has to rely on on robust guarantees on fundamental rights. Uh, and, and here the agreement commits the UK to continue applying the European Convention on Human Rights, giving it force uh, in front of British courts, in front of British judges, which is of course essential. And it also commits both parties to maintaining adequate data protection uh, standards that will obviously on our side be regularly uh, uh, assessed. Uh, there are further elements, uh, but I will, will pass quickly uh, uh, on those uh, to move on to uh, the final uh, important pillar uh, of the partnership, which is the slide I was on earlier, uh, which is then uh, governance. Uh, of course, to make sure that this partnership is effective and credible in the long term, one needs very strong governance provision. I think the the events and the relations in uh, the last uh, few weeks, months, years uh, uh, certainly highlight that. Uh, so the agreement, first of all, establishes a joint partnership council comprised of representatives of the EU and UK to oversee the implementation of the agreement. And this is, uh, if you want, uh, the forum for political dialogue and consultation, uh, which in the end, of course, also has the power to take binding decisions by mutual consent. And, and, and this, as you might have seen, this Partnership Council is assisted in its work by uh, a number of specialized committees covering the various areas of the agreement. Uh, of course, political dialogue and consultation is nice, but it doesn't always uh, work out. Uh, so if a solution to this agreement cannot be found within these bodies, uh, then the agreement foresees, and this is a very classical uh, third country agreement model um, the, for the possibility of establishment of an independent arbitration tribunal uh, to settle, a, settle the matter with uh, binding ruling. Uh, and this horizontal dispute settle mechanism covers most areas of the agreement, including crucially on level playing field, on fisheries. These were areas that the UK did not want to see subject to binding uh, ruling. They are. Uh, and of course, it's also accompanied by uh, enforcement and safeguard uh, mechanism. So, so if something goes wrong, uh, there is a ruling, something is wrong, uh, then there is the possibility to suspend market access commitments, e.g. Uh, reintroducing tariffs uh, or quotas. And, and also there's a possibility, in fact, it's a, a quite a ambitious toolbox. Uh, both parties will be able to cross-react, retaliate if, uh, if, if the other party does not comply ruling of the independent arbitration uh, uh, tri tri tribunal. And, and finally, and, and maybe last point here to, to, to mention is if there is a substantial brief of obligations enshrined is what you are called the essential elements of the agreement. For instance, the fight against climate change, respect for democratic values, uh, non-proliferation. Uh, there is a possibility to trigger the suspension or termination of all or part of the entire uh, agreement. And this is, I mention it because it was important for the EU, this is the very first time that the fight against climate change is included as an essential element in an EU trade agreement. Of course, the aim in all this is not to be forced uh, to apply uh, these measures, but it is to anchor our cooperation in, in a stable and sustainable uh, governance uh, uh, regime. So that, that brings me to the end of, of the description I wanted to do of uh, the, um, the content of the TCA. Uh, and, and to close it off, what I thought I could do was to uh, provide some thoughts on, on the outcomes, what it means on the ground, the road ahead, 
and uh, the uh, wider uh, context. So uh, if you see this uh, new slide, uh, the first thing I wanted to say uh, a few words about was what this agreement means on the ground. Um, I, I touched upon it briefly. Of course, the agreement resolves many issues, uh, in particular for citizens, our businesses, that does uh, in a way, uh, in many ways, allow us to look more positively at our future relationship with the UK. But what is abundantly clear is that this is less. This is less than membership, it's less than the single market, it's less than the customs union. And this CCA agreement does not regulate everything. And leaving the EU has very definitive and uh, inevitable consequences. I think since the 1st of January, uh, you, you mentioned this, Ulf, we have uh, taken greater measure, in fact, on both sides, on, on these, uh, of these new, sometimes difficult realities. Uh, many businesses and professionals face new procedures and formalities. Uh, uh, artists uh, cannot travel as easy as before on tour. Uh, uh, there is uh, a significant cost to uh, supply chains, which often need to be reorganized, and so on and so forth. So, although many had uh, prepared themselves, such as obtaining uh, necessary authorizations, adapting value and logistic change, to be less dependent on UK suppliers operators. This is not yet the case for all. And, and I think it's uh, a first uh, lesson of these uh, uh, first months uh, of 2021 is that it will take time for everyone to uh, adapt. Uh, the UK wanted uh, to uh, put an end uh, to the free movement of persons. Uh, so it means that British citizens will not have the freedom to work, study or reside in the European Union. And it means uh, that as an EU citizen, one will need uh, uh, a passport, that was already the case, to travel to the UK, but a visa for long-term stay. And similarly, it was the UK choice to put an end to the free movement of goods. Well, that has very real-life consequences. All goods from the United Kingdom, henceforth, are subject to import procedures under the, the Union's Customs Code. And, and uh, all goods moving between the EU and UK are to customs declarations, which was not the case in the past. And, and, and similarly, the UK wanted to put an end to free movement of services, and this has very real life consequences. Um, UK service providers have to obtain the necessary authorizations in each member state where they wish to operate. Uh, they are subject to specific rules of each national market, and financial service providers, for instance, do not have access to European uh, financial uh, uh, passport. A question that is linked to this, of course, uh, to the question of, of what happens on the ground is what this means for the future EU-UK relationship also at a uh, political level. Uh, you were talking, Ulf, about um, a blame game. Um, uh, this is, uh, I, I wouldn't want to use the word blame game myself. Uh, what what I, I wanted to say is that these adaptations, the consequences, uh, it's obviously a very topical. Again, it will take time for uh, everyone to adapt. And I think it, it's in that context that we're looking at the relationship that uh, for years to come, uh, at least months to come, will continue to be uh, very demanding. Uh, maybe it is in fact inevitable that this relationship uh, we'll be testing, uh, we'll be frosty at times. Uh, but I think also it's important for both sides to be able to look beyond the difficulties. There's a huge responsibility on both sides to make the agreements work, uh, in, particularly, in particular in the context of the island, uh, Northern Island Protocol. Uh, from the EU side, certainly one does not foresee any renegotiations or adaptations of the agreements uh, just concluded. So the next week will be very important to render the new agreement fully operational, uh, operational and the Commission has the role of being very diligent in monitoring uh, their application. And, and uh, I don't want to, to comment on, on the latest sort of exchange of, of words, but uh, as Vice President Sefkovic stated yesterday, uh, the EU will certainly remain firm on its political and legal uh, obligations and he also expressed uh, strong concerns and these are his words not mine on the respect of the island northern island protocol following you
UK's unilateral announcement. Uh, this is what we saw yesterday. Again, a second time the UK government is set to breach international uh, law. Uh, so, so again, these are Vice President Sefko, Sefkovic's words. So, so, um, so there are huge responsibilities and challenges in uh, very clearly in making this partnership work, in making these agreements uh, work, in making the protocol uh, applicable. Uh, I think if we look at or to look at uh, this a silver lining here, I think I would maybe choose the words of Michael Gove. Uh, who described this as turbulence that is uh, inevitable as a plane take off. And then he maybe a bit, uh, well, humorously said that sometime soon, however, one should be able to, to sit back in this plane uh, once we've re uh, reached a uh, cruising altitude, uh, buckle off the seatbelt, enjoy peanuts and, and drinks. But uh, it's very clear that for the time being, we are not yet uh, there. Then I wanted to uh, say a few words on what this means for the EU's uh, relationship uh, with other third countries. So it's broader third country relationship. Again, this is uh, of the nature of more of a uh, personal opinion, but uh, I, I think that these negotiations for the EU have been uh, very clearly uh, a standard bearer on transparency and also on interinstitutional cooperation. Uh, between all EU institutions and including all member states. I think the negotiations have also been on uh, substance. If you look at the LPF uh, level playing field commitments I mentioned, these are obviously tailored to the UK's economic importance at our doorstep. This is what the slides uh, highlight. Uh, UK is a huge economy at our doorstep. Uh, uh, if you look at, at, at the the, the trade figures, um, I think this bubble slide illustrates it quite well. Uh, but uh, even though the UK situation is exceptionally exceptional, I think at least personally that elements of what was agreed in the TCA will be very difficult to avoid in the future. Uh, Mich uh, Michel Barnier said this many times that the TCA for the EU was about a new generation of trade agreements, uh, not only about breaking down barriers, uh, tariff barriers or the barriers, but about keeping and raising standards. And, and this is very clear in the political clauses I, I mentioned on climate, but also on, on the, the sanctionable non-aggression uh, rules uh, that uh, we have in the TCA that we don't have uh, elsewhere. And I can also say that throughout these negotiations, uh, across the agreement uh, chapters uh, on the EU side, on the Commission side, we were very attentive to, to precedent. Uh, so, for instance, to take an example, when we're negotiating fisheries, the UK wanted uh, quota shares for fisheries to be based on zone attachment. Uh, that was something that the EU could not agree to because we are very well aware that whatever we were doing in this TCA would have uh, significant ramifications. Then maybe very shortly what this means uh, for Norway. Uh, well, first of all, I think the main political point is that a good and orderly relationship between the EU and the UK is fundamentally in Norway's interest. Um, uh, to have uh, an orderly Europe, uh, a law-based uh, Europe, uh, good uh, neighborly relations is of course in, in, in all of uh, our interests. Uh, second, I think it's important to note uh, for Norway and for the EA countries that the agreement was negotiated uh, with, a, I would say, also an unprecedented degree of transparency and dialogue with the EA EFTA countries. And, and this was a very conscious, cho conscious uh, choice uh, by the Commission, by Michel Barnier, uh, seeing the EA EFTA countries as co-owners co of uh, the and, and it comes back a little bit to the staircase uh, slide I was showing you earlier. Uh, earlier. The, the EEA uh, EFTA countries are on, on clearly on the second uh, step and, and protecting the integrity of the single market is a responsibility uh, that also concerns uh, Iceland, uh, Liechtenstein and Norway. And the final point I would say on what it means for Norway is, of course, that I think this TCA provides both, um, well, negative and positive boundaries to Norway's own relationship to the UK. First of all, 
through the single market, it sets limits uh, as to what, when now uh, the EAFD countries, Norway, will seek to uh, finalize its own future relationship trade agreement with the UK. The TCA does set limits as to what exactly can be agreed as uh, in so far as uh, the single market is concerned. So this comes in in the area of TBTs, mutual recognition, uh, aviation, certain other areas. But I think the TCA also sets uh, positive boundaries in a sense for for Norway's uh, Iceland and Liechtenstein's negotiations. Uh, I think the TCA's negotiation results show um, something that uh, uh, these three countries can take inspiration from and also to a certain extent use as leverage or as example. If UK has granted something to the EU, it it would be very natural if it's something that Norway, Liechtenstein or Iceland uh, that they could ask for that uh, too. And then finally, to, to round it all off, uh, and I promise to conclude with that, I just wanted to say a few words about what uh, this agreement uh, means uh, for uh, the EU. Uh, I think the first thing maybe to note now that we, we look back to, well, we look back five years, is that um, in a way these negotiations uh, proved the doomsayers wrong. Uh, we might have forgotten it, but there was a lot of doubt, uh, a lot of self-doubt in the EU, but also beyond uh, in the context of the British uh, Brexit uh, vote. Uh, doubts uh, as to what would happen with the EU, with the possibility of a further unraveling uh, of uh, the Union. I, I, I remember Marine Le Pen talked uh, about the fall uh, of uh, the Berlin Wall, uh, with everything she meant to insinuate by that. Uh, in the Netherlands, you have Wilders um, who uh, spoke about how the British liberating Europe from a totalitarian monsters, monster like in this. Uh, of course, these are extreme voices uh, in the European debate. But even the Swedish Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mar Margot Wallström, uh, said at the time that uh, she foresaw a string of other referendums uh, uh, across uh, the Union with the possibility of other member states uh, leaving. So I think that is, is the first sort of big macro lesson, I would say, that the EU has managed to come through this uh, uh, united and and as a whole. Uh, that takes me to the second point, I would say, which lies precisely in the value of unity and solidarity. Uh, I mentioned in the context of Ireland, when existential interest is at stake, then everybody stands shoulder to shoulder. Otherwise, there's no value in the union. And, and the third um, important uh, lesson, I would say, for the EU is um, was that clearly one wanted and needed this orderly process and outcome, uh, not only in its own right, but also to allow the EU to move on. Uh, and I think the uh, example of that um, is the next generation EU with the 1.8 billion recovery financing. Uh, there are important changes taking place uh, in the EU itself. And I can echo uh, what you said in your introduction, Ulf, about the exchange you had with with your, a German a government interlocutor. I think actually Merkel herself says uh, repeatedly in public and also at the European Council, she says that the future of uh, Europe is in fact much more important than uh, Brexit. And I think that has also been very much uh, uh, a guiding light uh, in these uh, negotiations. So I think I'll uh, leave it at that. I've been uh, rather uh, long uh, all, uh, already. Uh, Brexit is complex. Um, I can just show you this little cartoon uh, from the French newspaper Le Monde that seeks to uh, illustrate uh, this. Uh, so thank you for your attention. I look forward to hearing your reactions to the agreement and, and also taking your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Georg. Uh, this was uh, very good. Uh, you you managed to provide an overview of uh, of Brexit and also the content that uh, in a very short and brief period of time. So I don't know if you want to uh, take down the slides now from your presentation. So uh, if 
if you want to do that. And then I would just like to say to, to all the people following this uh, presentation that you are now, of course, invited to join in and please send your uh, questions and comments in the chat function and they will then be fed into me and I can address them to, to Georg. Now, uh, we have some questions already, but let me just start uh, Georg, with, with a very uh, simple question in some sense. Uh, also, a point of clarification, you touched upon this. Some scholars see Brexit as a constitutional moment also for the EU. And you you basically argue that, uh, that the EU has reflected on its own kind of mode of organization and in drawing up the boundaries of what it should be to be a non-member in somehow the EU also reflected on what are the requirements of being a member. So it's been a redrawing of, board, of borders between membership and non-membership. Uh, and I think that has huge implications for Norway, because uh, as you alluded to, Georg, Norway has been drawn as, in my eyes, is, is seen more as an insider than an outsider in this process. And that, of course, creates lots of opportunities also for Norway. But you stressed the innovation aspect of the TCA. Uh, one of the unique things with Brexit is that there is no established an alternative mode of association to the EU. Prior to this, the Swiss model was seen as an accident, not as a model. And then we had the EA agreement. Do you see that this TCA model is somehow a ready-made model? that others could copy as well? Or does, do you see it as unique to this special British uh, situation? Uh, so do you see that this UK model should be also transposed also into the Swiss dis discussion, for instance, and also be relevant to all EU countries if they want to leave or are forced out? Uh, or could it also be on the table for Norway? I think this is a very important question in the Norwegian political debate these days. So are there some kind of general features that is uh, part of the conversation in the EU? So that's the first com uh, question, Georg. Well, thank you. Those are, 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 are very interesting questions that go to, to the heart of, of how this, uh, this process will be looked at and the, 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 the TCA will be looked at in the future. On, on the first question, the, the constitutional point or the constitutional moment, uh, I think in, in, in a certain obvious sense, yes, uh, it was the first time uh, a, union, a, a member state left the union. It was the first time the Article 50 was activated. And this was a uh, process of discovery um, uh, for the union itself, for its institutions, for its member states of, of what exactly this Article 50 entailed, what it meant, um, uh, how one would and could deal with, with, with the withdrawing uh, member states. But I think also more profoundly, like you say, that it has been a process of rediscovery uh, for uh, the union itself and for its member states of what membership means. Uh, the single market is something one has taken for granted. Uh, the customs union is something uh, one has taken uh, for granted. And, and, and frankly, I'm, I'm, I'm not exaggerating uh, if I say that if we zoom back or go back uh, four years, uh, even inside here in the Commission, there were not that many people who uh, could uh, give a clear, uh, detailed, uh, technical explanation of what the customs union uh, entailed uh, in terms of a real impact uh, on, on the economy. So, so very clearly, uh, this has been a process of rediscovery of uh, the, the union's uh, identity and a process of rediscovery of, of what membership uh, uh, entails and very clearly also drawing up uh, a line between uh, a limit between membership uh, and, and and third countries uh, between being inside uh, and uh, outside. Uh, your second question, innovation aspect. Uh, yes, I think that the TCA is uh, 
uh, innovative in uh, very many respects. Uh, it is certainly very broad and uh, comprehensive. I touched upon the number of points where uh, it does things that one has not done in the context of other uh, third uh, country agreements. I would be a little bit more careful uh, on this point, though, in, in of the third uh, uh, countries. I'm I'm not so uh, sure about that because I think, uh, well, of course, there are elements that can be taken and, and can be interesting for a future trade relationship. But I don't think it's a it's it's sort of a off the shelf solution for 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 third countries. You mentioned the EA countries. You mentioned. Uh, Switzerland. I think both the EEA uh, countries and Switzerland, they have developed their relationship with the EU in a specific uh, historic uh, uh, context. And uh, I think if you take the situation of Switzerland, the direction of travel between uh, the, the situations of UK and Switzerland are, are, are not comparable. Uh, Switzerland is um, very much uh, participating uh, in the single market through a series of bilateral agreements, whereas the UK's direction of travel was very much to leave uh, the uh, single market. So, so the resulting uh, level of integration are uh, fundamentally different. And that is also why I think uh, the TCA, its governance, the different provision is one thing, whereas the this EU Swiss uh, institutional uh, framework uh, that's on the table is uh, something uh, different. Um, so so, um, so I would rather be rejecting your claim that uh, certain negotiated outcomes here with uh, the UK might be relevant for EU-Switzerland uh, context. Uh, and and if, any case, if any argument were to be made, uh, if such a comparison uh, were to be made. I think we've asked quite a bit of the UK in the area of of of, of uh, uh, state aid, for instance. I, I don't think this in any case, uh, in any way, would then weaken what one would be asking in terms of state aid controls and, and uh, institutional framework uh, from Switzerland. And also, similarly, for the for the EA, of course, one, one can never exclude the hypothetical uh, um, case where where uh, an EEA uh, EFTA country says, OK, we want to step out of the EEA agreement. I think that needs to, that would have to be considered very carefully because, uh, first of all, it's EU's uh, view that the agreement has served all parties very well. But I, I think one should be very careful, uh, and I noted this notably in the debate in Norway, to consider that the TCA delivers something that is better than the EEA or delivers a model that would work uh, uh, better for Norway, for instance, than and the EEA agreement. Again, these agreements respond to different historical contexts, but also, uh, put it very blunt bluntly, interests, economic interests on the ground. Uh, take two specific examples. Um, uh, agriculture. Uh, for uh, the UK or the EU-UK TCA agreement, we have zero tariffs, zero quotas uh, on agriculture products. I uh, find it very far-fetched to imagine that uh, the, that is something that uh, the Norway could enter into or start discussing with, with, uh, with the EU if one were to have a renegotiation situation. Quite the contrary, I think very much the Norwegian's uh, position has been premised on protecting its agriculture sector. Uh, so, 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 I mean, it's just one example where, where where we are looking at very different uh, positions and, and, and starting points. Another example is fisheries. I think those voices in Norway that speak up for a TCA model for Norway, I think they should be looking very, very carefully at the fisheries uh, chapter of the TCA and ask themselves if that is the kind of uh, fisheries agreement, fisheries relationship that uh, they would want uh, to have. Uh, with the EU. Again, all these models are the reflection of, uh, of, of the, the interest of, 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 of both parties, but also of a balance of rights and obligations. And, 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 and to say it a bit bluntly, but there is nothing that is 
uh, given for, for free. If you want to be closely integrated and have the value that comes with that, you also have to uh, accept the obligations that come with that. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, we have lots of questions. Let me just take one because it relates. Just first, a point of clarification. As I understand it, Georg, uh, the trade arrangement. So you have the free trade on goods as long as the UK comply with the rules of origins and certain standards. Hmm? Uh, standards in environment, social standards, etc. So, so basically, the agreement is an obligation on the UK to trade based on EU regulations and standards. But the UK have no say in formulating those standards. So this is basically the notion about homogeneity. But at the same time, what kind of mechanism is there for uh, updating of new regulations? Mm -hmm. Now, these days, the EU is preparing a fit for 55 new set of rules and regulations uh, related to the Green Deal, etc. So how, uh, how is this going to supposed to be updated into the new UK agreement? So that's the first question. Mm -hmm. The second is relates to some of the points that uh, Pernille Riker and Marianne Riddevold and others have asked in the chat, relates to some of the areas not covered in this, this agreement, and in particular uh, foreign security uh, policy and, and, that, and that sphere. Uh, as we remember, Theresa May at the time, she announced that the UK basically wanted a very comprehensive and extensive relationship with the UK also in the field of foreign security policy. But at the end of the day, those areas were not covered by the agreement. Uh, uh, but uh, all parties seem to be ready somehow to start at one point in time, probably to reflect on, on modo association dialogue, etc. On mm -hmm. those areas. So, could you say a few words about what happened to foreign security and defense, and and, and uh, when is it likely to 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 start uh, a conversation on that? Yeah. So uh, uh, there are two questions here. Uh, the first one was on uh, what exactly uh, the free trade entails. Um, so free trade. So what the, the the TCA or the FTA within the TCA offers is uh, trading on uh, a zero tariff, zero quota uh, terms, provided that rules of origin are uh, respected. So that means basically it creates, uh, it preserves value chains uh, within the free trade uh, area. But then you, you talk about standards, Ulf, and I think what's important here is to distinguish two things. You have to distinguish product standards from uh, production standards. Uh, Product standards is the standard that any product uh, need to comply with to be able to circulate on the single market. And that is, uh, de by definition, uh, the standards of uh, the, the market of destination. So if uh, a UK product, whatever, uh, uh, a bicycle is to enter the single market, then uh, it needs to comply with EU co product standards for bicycles. Uh, and that is uh, a given. It's the way it is for every third country. I mean, and that's precisely the advantage of being in the single market for other countries like Norway, where you by definition comply and you have mutual recognition, etc. This is not the case for the UK as a third country. They have to comply with standards. But one has to distinguish uh, uh, product standards from production standards for production uh, um, uh, uh, yeah, production standards, what, what, what uh, con conditions of a production of, say, that bicycle. And this is where the level playing field comes uh, in. So very clearly, the production standards is, as they change in the EU, well, every expert will dynamically have to continue to follow EU product standards. The LPF, uh, the, the level playing field uh, standards, the production standards, a little bit different. Here we're talking about uh, not the intrinsic characteristics of the bicycle itself. We're talking about uh, the the wage wage regime for the workers at that factory, uh, the, the health and safety. We're talking about uh, environmental uh, rules. We're talking about emissions, uh, very often crucially. And what this uh, agreement does, what it delivers, 
is uh, this what I mentioned earlier is the non-regression rule, which is sanctionable, which one doesn't have in other trade agreements. So it means that basically neither the EU nor the UK can move away from the level of, uh, of, of standards in this area, environment, climate, etc., that were uh, the common standards at the end of the transition period. So on the 1st of January uh, 2021. Uh, so that will stay. And then your question is, how does this, uh, uh, what is the dynamic element to this? Why, what guarantee does one have that this does not, uh, there is not a discrepancy over time and hence there's a, uh, a divergence and, and the purpose of Brexit is divergence. So, so indeed it's something one has to, to deal with. And, and, and here what we have in this agreement, I can try to share it, uh, is uh, a very uh, innovative uh, mechanism which recognizes this divergence. It's theoretically there, it's practically there. And, and so we have uh, the uh, uh, series of provisions that you can call rebalancing measures, which has, which, uh, which in essence means that if you see significant divergences over time in the area of labor, social, environment, crime protection, also subsidy control, and that this has a material impact on trade or investment, then uh, there is a possibility for a party to apply rebalancing uh, me uh, measures to do this rather uh, forcefully, quickly. Um, uh, you can see on the slide that there's a very short consultation period. Uh, there's a rule arbitration tribunal within 30 days. And, and, and so you can have uh, then uh, uh, countermeasures from a party if it sees that these divergences uh, on uh, the regulatory side is creating uh, distortions. Of course, this is this is very important, and it's it's a very innovative part of 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 the of the agreement. So so that's my my answer to your questions on on standard. Then was a, a second question on uh, on uh, on the the foreign affairs uh, uh, file. This is also uh, an interesting uh, topic. Um, I think in line with sort of the fundamental objectives that the EU set itself for these negotiations, to have a close uh, uh, relationship with the UK in a dangerous world, of course, from the EU side, there was a strong wish to have uh, cooperation on, on foreign policy, uh, external security, defense, uh, development aid, uh, cyber security, and so on and so forth. And, and, and this is something that um, found its way into the political declaration uh, that was signed at the same time of the withdrawal agreement. You're right to highlight um, uh, Theresa May stands on this. After sort of at the very start of the negotiations, there was some kind of a in, um, well suggestion that there could be a quid pro quo or a trade off between security and, and trade on the UK side. Theresa May very quickly moved away from that and said very clearly that the UK would be unconditionally in favor of this. So we had great hope of ambition in this area. That was not the line that was followed uh, by John, uh, the Johnson government, this, uh, despite the fact that they also signed the political declaration. Uh, and this was ratified in the context of the withdrawal agreement by the House of Commons. One of the very first things that happened in the negotiations uh, in, in, in March last year was that the UK told us that they did not want to discuss on these issues at all. Uh, so they took the, these topics off the table completely. Um, and, and of course, that was a strong disappointment, but there's little one can do. It's a, it's a case of what one calls it takes two to, to tango. So one did not have discussions on all these dimensions of foreign policy, security and defense, cooperation on sanctions, uh, uh, political dialogue uh, on, uh, on important matters of foreign policy, working together in the UN, uh, uh, Security Council, there's a number of areas one ideally one would want to be able to work together. Nonetheless, even though all these things were taken off the table, uh, also the participation of, of, of UK uh, forces in EU operations and missions, uh, uh, consular uh, cooperation, etc. 
there are some elements that that uh, have been safeguarded in the TCA. It's sort of hidden at the very end of, of the agreement. Uh, so uh, I mentioned before there are these essential elements uh, in the partnership. So uh, working together on the promotion of democracy, uh, rule of law, uh, human rights, uh, fight against climate change, uh, fight against uh, the proliferation of uh, weapons of mass uh, destruction. Uh, there is also a, a cooperation framework uh, on, on, on the most uh, serious crimes against uh, uh, humanity on, or the international community. Uh, there's a cooperation framework that's alluded to there in the fight against terrorism. Uh, there's also something on cybersecurity. And there's also sort of a statement of ambition uh, on uh, that one, the UK and the EU will work together in on the great questions of of um, of, of uh, the great global questions of common interest. Uh, well, of course, being peace and, and security, sustainable development, environmental protection, uh, uh, digital challenges, public health, uh, uh, tax matters, etc. So it is in there, but it is not very much fleshed out in terms of a, a cooperation framework. So it is the right question you are asking. Will the TCA at some point be supplemented uh, by further elements of cooperation on this? Uh, it might happen on the, in the future. Uh, I don't think it's on the table right now. Uh, I think, uh, first of all, funda fundamentally, the UK's position has not changed. Uh, it would require the, the Johnson government to say that they want to do this. Uh, so far, they have not. Uh, and, and also, on, uh, there was a discussion amongst uh, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, not that many weeks ago uh, under the impetus of High Representative Borrell, where it was clear that uh, as long as the UK does not signal the willingness to deepen the partnership in this area, uh, it's, it's not for the EU to, to, to pose a necessary as as demander or uh, to to stand there with this uh, with a hat in the hand asking for 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 this to come place. But of course, personally, and I think very many on the EU side are 100% convinced that it is in the the parties' mutual interest to 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 work more closely in a number of these areas. Okay, I, uh, I think that there are two things to this. Uh, the first is. On the dynamic element. If you remember back in Norway's relationship with the EEA, so uh, at the first period, Norway never, also never took in uh, veterinary regulations, for instance, but after a few years, recognized that salmon and other fishes uh, they didn't kind of survive very well uh, in a in a container. On the back of a car, right? So that so so it was critical for for speedy access to the market that they had uh, took in the whole veterinary protocol. And today, I think uh, by far the biggest section of uh, EU rules and regulations in Norway relates exactly to veterinary mm. uh, standards. It says, so it could be possible that that the UK also will see that okay, let's make some adjustments. Add the veterinary protocol, etc., to the agreement. So, so and I understand you that those kind of expansions of the agreement, it's possible, but that would be, it's not something that is following as an obligation from the agreement as it is today. Uh, now, uh, to the to the second point on, on foreign and security policy. Uh, let me ask you to take one step back from from the seat of the Commission because. Uh, one part of the story that you have told is basically that the EU has been fairly unified. The Commission has been uh, the leader and member states have not kind of seriously infringed on this unity. You have, you have had the mandate and, and the UK have negotiated with the Commission. This was slightly different than perhaps the Brits initially thought it would be. Oh, oh, so the Brexit process has been a process of EU unification somehow. Now on, on foreign and security policy, it might be that um, uh, if the UK is unwilling to engage in a uh, conversation with the EU on foreign and security policy, some of the member states in the EU uh, would like to expand and develop that relationship. So how do you see the relationship between 
let's say unity and flexibility created by by Brexit at the larger in a larger perspective on the future of European integration and uh, let's say this multi-speed Europe uh, differentiation flexibility all kinds of labels that are used to describe this was it maybe a bit unclear question but uh, no 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 yeah. it's thanks clear and it's a very interesting uh, question to come to your first point on on sort of the dynamic element and I think again it's it's very we need to put the the UK and, and Norway as so you took take those two examples in separate uh, baskets uh, because uh, well you, you you're saying it what the Norway they discovered in the context of, of salmon exports but also on other issues was that it's fundamental is interest uh, lies in convergence and and or actually more than the convergence it's alignment on SBS it's part of the single market and that means that uh, when you have uh, uh, a salmon fillet that is uh, prepared up in Nor uh, northern Norway it can go directly to the French consumer because it, it respects all, all rules so we are here in a paradigm of I think very much both parties uh, and shows very much Norwegian economic interest. This was not at all the political project of Brexit. Uh, Brexit was had a very political dimension to it, obviously, and that political dimension is uh, that of taking back control and is precisely divergence. And that is why one has a very different model. One has ended up on a very different model, which is one of, of divergence, which has uh, uh, elements of, of common standards of non-regression, but uh, this uh, logic of rebalancing in case divergence takes uh, place. So, so of course, you might be right that in the future, a future UK government might say, well, we, 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 we want, uh, say, a Swiss-style veterinary agreement uh, with the EU. Uh, and uh, that's totally different premises than what the UK government wants now. So, so, so as long as as the UK's uh, fundamental objective here is uh, divergence, taking back control, uh, not uh, following, uh, say, some supranational set of, of norms or standards, typically in the SPS area, uh, that has consequences on the flow of goods and the control of borders. Every animal product is uh, being controlled at the single market uh, uh, outer uh, border. On foreign policy, of course, you take the, the, the question uh, one step further and, 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 and deeper and say, OK, some, something will not happen. It does not look imminent in this field uh, uh, at the level of, of the EU. And of course, it might very be, well be uh, uh, the, the, the UK's um, uh, secret little thought in this that rather than doing something that is uh, uh, in a way recognizes the EU as as uh, as as an important play in this area, uh, they would rather go bilateral with with member states. And of course, there are varying interests uh, across uh, uh, across the 27. Uh, the interests are not the same. Uh, on uh, for for countries uh, bordering on the Mediterranean, as they are uh, uh, for those member states looking eastwards, uh, thinking of the Baltics, uh, uh, for instance. So, so uh, I don't think we um, uh, one can in any way prevent that you have uh, bilateral initiatives. Uh, the EU is not a complete. An exclusive security organization. It doesn't replace uh, in any way NATO, uh, the idea of territorial defense. It doesn't uh, in any way replace uh, bilateral uh, foreign policy and defense relationship between member states and UK. For instance, France has a very developed uh, uh, defense relationship with UK, much closer than they have uh, with Germany. Uh, France actually, France and UK actually have mutual dependence uh, in 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 certain certain areas of of defense actions when it comes to using uh, their their fighter planes and their missiles. Uh, it's the Lancaster House um, Agreement. So so this this will obviously continue, and it's not the purpose of the EU to um, uh, to replace that. Uh, but I think what is important is 
that in the context of these bilateral relationship and also sometimes sort of plurilateral or, or multilateral formats, you can think of the E3 uh, that has uh, been very important uh, in the context of the Iran negotiations, where obviously UK, uh, uh, France and Germany have played a specific roles. There is a possibility for these to con continue, but I think what will be important and also that's the, the role of each and every one of the member states to look after and also of the high representative that the way these the negotiations or the, these relations, I should rather say, are being developed bilaterally, that this does not prejudice uh, the union's interest uh, as uh, as a whole. Uh, so, so definitely for for the EU, it's a challenge for for each and every member state. It's not the UK that will look after this for us, but but it will have to be have to be done. Yeah. Okay, excellent. I see the time is 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 running. So, so we probably have to 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 end up, but but. Um, uh, thank you so much, uh, Georg, for for taking uh, so much of your time uh, to share your experience and insights. But uh, if you have the time or allow me to, could I ask you just one final question, a, a, a bit more on a, per, a personal level, mm -hmm. because you've dedicated now probably four years or more than four years uh, in negotiating Brexit. So uh, could you s s just uh, reflect a bit on? on uh, kind of uh, maybe the workload what has surprised you the most uh, what uh, what did you find most exciting provocative what uh, <laughs> something uh, something that kind of gives a bit flavor a personal flavor to it because in some sense it's a huge system it's a legal system you talked about disintegration mm. it's also lots of personal effort to, into this is this the shape was it shaped a bit by you and uh, barnier or is this a kind of personal touch in the in this at all? Well, you're right to say it's been a long process, and I've I've, I've worked for now for eleven years in the Commission, and 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 these more than four years on on the Brexit negotiation have been absolutely fascinating, been very tiring, uh, very demanding, not only on me but on uh, family and family of all uh, all my colleagues. Um, so, but I mean, it's it's uh, it, you touched upon it. There's been a used uh, a unique process uh, in a way, a sort of semi-constitutional moment or rediscovery for for the EU. So, I think what um, uh, if I I'm, if I look back four years and how we started, we started off with. Uh, uh, just we were just a couple of people around Banye uh, with sort of a PowerPoint slide drawing. So what we think this process will look like, and 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 this was a process very much uh, which was about uh, learning by doing, uh, rediscovering uh, together, working with the European Parliament, the member states, with the, uh, um, a huge range of of Commission services to figure out what the EU negotiation position uh, would be, but also to figure out what uh, what uh, what leaving the union meant. And it has been really interesting in this negotiation beyond all these um, technical aspects, which are uh, innumerable. Uh, it's it's been the political dynamic and it's been to be able to to follow how uh, this unity and solidarity amongst the 27 member states and the three institutions has been constructed day by day, how uh, uh, to participate from the very beginning in, in, in the round after round of, of EU capitals meeting with uh, EU prime ministers, uh, each where they, with their specific concerns, national interests, but also fundamentally, even those who can sometimes, uh, those capitals or those prime ministers who sometimes can be at odds with the EU pro project uh, or aspects of it, in these negotiations, uh, they very much uh, signaled and decided that they would stick together. And I think that was comes from sort of a heightened sense of responsibility around everything that happened in 2016, where the, the EU was out of a financial crisis, Eurozone crisis, migration crisis, you had Brexit, you had the election of Trump. So you, there was a heightened sense of responsibility uh, around the European Council uh, table where one sort of saw uh, Europe's world unraveling. And, and, and that was 
very interesting to 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 be sort of a, a spectator to uh, these discussions and be, be a very small and modest part uh, of during this whole uh, process. And then, of course, I there were different aspects of the negotiation. Uh, I worked a lot with uh, all with member states in the first part. In the second part of the negotiations, I had more of a role in uh, on on sort of the old overall strategy and setup of the negotiation. And towards the the end, in the very final months, on the fisheries negotiations, and and of course, it's uh, it was of course very much a nerve game. It, it was. Uh, uh, there was a, a clear threat of of, of no deal. Uh, there were clear aspects of uh, a game of of, of chicken uh, in in these negotiations. It was about holding one's nerves. Um, some commentators said that uh, uh, in the UK position uh, there was an element when they launched this internal market uh, bill, an element of sort of a, a madman strategy to international negotiations. So. So it, it, it's been very, very intense and, and interesting to. So now I think it's it's time for 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 a wrapping up, uh, not only of this uh, conference, but also of, for a breather uh, for, for me and many of my my colleagues. But but of course, we, we are under no illusion for those who will continue to work uh, on this, that uh, a number of the challenges are still ahead. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Georg, and and uh, and uh, thank you again for for taking your time and sharing your perspectives. And let me also just say that I think that congratulate you, uh, regardless of how you view or different uh, participants here view the outcome of the negotiations. I think most would agree that during these negotiations, the EU side looked a bit more orderly, a bit more consistent. Whereas in the UK, uh, we had more or less a, a reality show uh, TV style of a lot of drama and chaos. Uh, I hope you took some good notes uh, during these uh, uh, talks and during these years, because I would love to read your book about this, if there ever would be a book about uh, your experiences. But again, thank you so much for, for joining in. And then uh, I suggest that we just end this, uh, this seminar. Thank you so much, Georg. Thank you. And to all of you who participated. Thank you. It's for me to thank you. Thanks a lot. It's been a pleasure.